Why don't we get started? Welcome everyone to the Ward 4 and 7 MBA meeting. Wanted to go over some of the ground rules and um, you know words we try to live by on our NPA. Listen to others speaking. Respect the agenda and process. Share your opinion politely and treat people respectfully. You know, um, the NPA is your NPA, so um, the most the we get the most out of it when we put the most into it. So everyone have a good meeting. Um, we're going to change it up a little bit. And um, our new member of our steering committee, Olivia Taylor, is going to do introductions. Um, we'll have you say the word that you're from, and um, but she'll start off by reading off names. I wanted to just kind of tighten up this part of the um, meeting a little bit. Hi, everyone. I'm Olivia, and I am a member of Ward 7. I'm just going to go down the list of panelists and attendees and ask everyone to just introduce themselves. So, Jeff Comstock. Yes, uh, Jeff Comstock, Ward 7 Steering Committee. And then anyone at the Miller Center. Robert Bristow Johnson, I'm Ward 7. I happen to be on the redistricting committee. There's no one else here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, Jeff Clark, you already went. Uh, Carol Ode. <laughs> Carol Ode, and I am um, a state representative from District 6 1, Barney North End. And Ali. Yang, Ward 7 City Council. Thank you. Jim Hallway. <clears throat> oh. I don't see Jim, so I'll move on. Um, Jim. Oh, sorry, I had my phone. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Jim Hall, I work for a uh, redistricting committee. Sarah Carpenter. Sarah Carpenter, city councilor, uh, Ward 4. Um, Olivia or Muffy Millens. Oh, we can't hear you. It looks like we can't hear you. We'll come back to you. Um, Al Belushi? Yes, Al Belushi, Ward 7. And Bridget Bozak? Oh, you're on mute. Bridget Bozak, thank you, uh, Ward 4. Great. Edward Murphy? This is Ed Murphy speaking, uh, Ed Murphy, Ward 4, uh, resident, Burlington. Evan Litwin. Hi everyone, Evan Litwin, uh, Ward 4, and uh, nice to see everyone. Kendra Sowers. Hi, Kendra Sowers, Ward 4, and North District School Commissioner. Thank you. Mark Farlow. Hi, Mark Barlow, Ward 4, and North District City Councilor. Paul Constantino. Hi, actually, it's Maricela Constantino, uh, Ward 7. Matt Hurlburt. Thanks, Lydia. Matt Hurlburt, Ward 7, and Steering Committee. Robert Hooper. Um, Bob Hooper, um, Ward 4, State Representative, but I'm over in the County Committee meeting, so I'll just be monitoring the, the video here. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Sylvia Knight. I don't see you. Is Paul? Um, um, okay, I was muted. Ward seven. And 
and I think Paul Bushner is the last one, unless someone else has not been called. Let me know. <laughs> and we'll go back to Muffy too. Paul, you are on mute. All right, Muffy, why don't you go ahead? Okay, uh, Muffy Milans from Ward Seven. Olivia, we hey. have a we have a new person with us here at the Miller Center. Me? Yes, you. Wonderful. Peter Ireland, Ward Four. So, Peter, Peter's with us here at the Miller Center. Great, and Paul, I see you. You are on video now. Yes, Paul Bushner, Ward Four, Curtis Avenue. Great. Um, and then the last is, I don't know if anyone from the, the CEDO accounts would like to introduce themselves. Hi, this is Bridget. Hi, this is Ethan. Thank you. I think we got everyone. If you popped in while I was reading through, please feel free to unmute yourself and introduce now. Otherwise, I'll pass it back to Jeff. Great. Thanks, Olivia. Um, we're going to open it up now to announcements. If anyone has an announcement, um, you could raise your hand or in the Miller Center, let Jeff Comstock know. Sylvia, I see your hand up first. Yeah, I would. May I go? Sure. I want to let people know that um, Costello Waste Management is proposing um, it has a permit, um, a draft permit out to change how they deal with uh, leach it from the um, waste um the landfill up in Coventry and that could mean that you know depending on what method is used Montpelier the permit asks that Montpelier be the site for an expanded wastewater treatment to take out to try to take out various toxins um priority uh chemicals, contaminants, heavy metals, PFAS, um, and, but the residual would go into the Winooski River, and that's not good news for us. Uh, so I'm, if anyone is interested, I can, I don't know how to do this, what we're doing now, and send things, so, if there's someone who would who could send an email to others, I can share that. Uh, the hearing information is going to be hearing tomorrow, and co uh, comment is open until November eighth. So it could be uh, toxic leaches coming our way, depending on the methods chosen. That's all. For now. Okay, anyone else with an announcement? I guess the steering committee does have an announcement that we're um, moving the next month meeting. Um, and it will be, we're going to be discussing um, with the ad hoc redistricting committee. They had a meeting scheduled for the same day, the 15th, so we're going to um, look to see to Kind of share that um, meeting and um, we'll tell you more about that to follow. Yeah. <clears throat> and perhaps um, we're going to, at our next steering committee, we're going to talk about moving the December meeting um, earlier. I know we've skipped December in the past, but um, perhaps moving it to the 15th, but maybe the 22nd as well. We're um, contemplating um, having that be a public safety um, MPA meeting, so really dedicating that topic to the whole meeting. All right, and no other announcements, and um, anyone else see 
and we will um, go to elected officials. We have 30 uh, minutes on the calendar for you all. Um, City Council 10, School Board 10, Legislature 10. Is, does that work for you all? Okay, so maybe a two, three minute update from each and we'll do 10 minute slots with questions at the end of that 10 minutes. Does that work? Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll start off with City Council. I see Sarah Car Carpenter first. Um, Sarah, would you like to lead off? Sure. <laughs> um, we have had a pretty jam-packed month since our um, last meeting. Um, and I'm supposing that you want to follow it. Um, and I'll quickly let my colleague Fred fill in, um, fill in a lot of detail. Um, I think one of the um, big meetings we had is that we were able um, to resolve the police headcount issue based on the recommendations from the CNA report, which is out, and I encourage you to all look at it. It's very long and it's very detailed, um, so I don't expect anyone to um, know all the details, but there's, there's a lot there. Kind of related to the police headcount, I want to make sure that everybody understands that um, the department is hiring and has been hiring and wants to hire. So um, that's just a word we need to get out there very um, quickly and as broadly as we can. In addition to the police officers, we have open positions for community um, support officers. And um, we've, I think, hired four of those as well as three community um, service uh, liaisons and um, we've got authorization for another six of those so please get that word out. We were also, and I was grateful um, that we were able to approve um, the use of some of our federal funds for police um, bonuses and most importantly um, recruitment bonuses so hopefully that will help, it, help us with our our hiring process. Um, you know, we really need to be focused on the many more details of our public safety plans, and I hope we can move on with that. Um, again, we had a, a really uh, jam-packed month. We approved a, a um, resolution to ask the city to pull together a uh, mental health summit again primarily focused on public safety that's critical we've needed to do that for some time and um we need we need that asap that's really uh, as we all know a fundamental problem within our public safety um we had um quite a meeting the other day on sears lane and um councilor jane introduced a resolution or an amendment to a resolution that uh, help us come together with um, some programs and I think we're on a path. We are not on a path to solving homelessness for any, for sure, and I say that loud and clear even though I know I have the support of our reps here. It is a fundamental problem that has been, I um, need to say, dumped on the city of Burlington and we desperately need help from the state and um, the feds to to get that resolved. I know it's a priority, but we need to do better than we're doing. Um, and we are spending some of our other ARPA money. Uh, we're we're going to open a, a day station warming shelter, which means people have a place to go during the day um, to get off the streets if they truly are without permanent housing, and that would be a real plus. And then the library is going to kick in and help with storage of belongings. And for now, answer questions. We'll go to Mark Barbalo. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Sarah took some of my updates, so let me see what I what was online that she didn't already talk about. Um, in addition to the resolution we passed on um, recruitment and retention and on raising the sworn officer cap. Um, and the Mental Health Summit. We also passed a resolution to increase the Police Commission's oversight responsibilities through ordinance changes insofar as we can. 
Um, and we referred additional work to the Charter Change Committee to look at ways um, we may also strengthen that oversight responsibility. Um, the other thing I want to update on since our last NPA meeting was the municipal consolidated collection proposal failed. Um, so the city will not be taking over trash and compost services, but we do expect to take this issue up again in the near future to likely uh, consider a hybrid consolidated collection model that would involve city collection and recycling, and, uh, and we would franchise out the collection of trash and compost to private haulers. Um, that still isn't on our agenda. Uh, I expect that it's likely that that might uh, come about in November sometime. Um, we're about two thirds of the way done with tax appeal hearings after uh, doing that for uh, September and October. So we're hoping that we, I think we're gonna probably slip a week, but we're hoping by the first weekend of December we can be finished with those. And there's almost 600 of them. So um, it's a lot of work, um, but we're making a lot of good progress. And the last thing I wanted to mention is um, on Friday at 2 p.m., the city will be having um, a ceremony to name our newest city park at 311 North Avenue behind Cambrian Rives. So I'm planning on attending that, um, as I'm sure others are, and uh, excited to hear what the new name will be. And I'll pass it along to uh, Ollie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Pablo, and also uh, uh, Councilor Carpante. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, those, those were the main updates, but I think it would be important also to let people know that North Avenue would be getting some payment soon because the city received $175,000 grant from uh, the Agency of Transportation, e -trans. And uh, we believe that the bids will be here by, you know, the fall of 2021, and the project will probably start in the spring or summer of 2022, which is which is an amazing uh, and something great. And about the police cap, you know, it was 103. That was the cap previously before the uh, defunding the police, 74 police officers through attrition, 30 percent. Uh, now, I think the council did come together, and I want to personally thank Councilor um, um, Soraya Hightower for definitely getting out of her rank and doing the right thing for the city. And also, I want to thank everyone that worked around, you know, waiting until we receive the CNA update in order to make this, 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 this important decision. I think this is a way forward. Let's just base our decision around evidence. And I also want to thank the police officers for their hard work during this challenging and hard time uh, for being there, especially those that stay. I don't know if I agree with, uh, you know, using ARPA and give police officers to stay. I think we have to own our mistake by just putting them with this. But now what's important is from, you know, defending now we are at 87 police officers, which is just amazing. Um, the skiers land, like uh, Councilor Carpenter just talked about, I think the council again, Soraya Hightower, uh, did show again leadership, just getting out of her rank and doing the right thing. I think it is important for all of us to not only be like protesting, but we are called or elected to take the decision, the right and wonderful decision. And I'm glad that we visited that site even, even before this conversation, because businesses were concerned, uh, resident taxpayers, uh, parents, everybody was concerned about what was going on right there. Uh, the news media, the police, the fire department, but I'm glad that um, the mayor did show also leadership and uh, CVOU is right there to provide support and keep on helping those people to access. So nine of them already got house, one of them are considering it, two of them got vouchers to leave. There are maybe three, four or five people who do not have any information yet. And about the Mental Health Summit, I think it was a proposal from, let's say, the Police Commission, you know, which also I want to thank them also for being right there. And so that just next time, let's make sure that we do not react. Let's just act as, uh, you know, leaders of the city. Burlington is a great city and uh, happy fall, everyone. Thank you.
Okay, um, anyone have questions for our city councilors? Virgin, I see your hand first. Would you like to go? Thank you. I'm not sure if this is a question that should be addressed to the mayor during his presentation, but maybe what some of our city councilors can address it. I don't know if you can see it, but a lot of us got this in the mail the other day. Shows my age because it's a, um, I think it's the ARPA action plan, but it's telling us that um, the city's been awarded $15 million in federal funding from the Biden Rescue Plan and is asking us to fill up a fill a survey um, of how we'd like to see the funds used for the city of Burlington. Um, I'd like to get somebody from the city to address, I'm assuming this is postcard is accurate, I'm assuming it's not spam. Um, there are two, uh, there's a ballot out now asking us two questions to approve considerable bond funding. Where's the link between the $15 million from the from Washington and um, um, the uh, request to issue municipal bonds? So what's the deal with $15 million? Um, maybe I can do this. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I think, you know, previously, let's say it was about 27 to 28 million that the city has received from the federal ARPA fund, you know, and I think some of them was directly to the city, and some of that fund was around three million. It was about some funds that the people in Shitinan County has to um, share, basically, which would bring us to around seven, $27 million. But the city has already allocated some of those funds to some, like, uh, you know, the police department is one, um, the uh, electric department is one, uh, the, just sit back at place is one. But these 15 million, you are right. This is not, this is maybe what's remaining. This is the wiggle room, and the mayor is trying to find what the uh, voters of Burlington would want to do with that money. You know, uh, personally, I think as elected officials, we know exactly where that money could be utilized uh, for the best use of everyone, right? But I'm glad that he want to hear the perspective of the people and reason why it's important for anyone to definitely fill out that survey, send it back to the mayor. And from what I'm hearing, the biggest item people want to see change for this money to be used is about homelessness. What? Homelessness, homelessness. People who are unhoused, who don't have housing. Um, and I'm just gonna let you. And I'm pretty sure about the bound, like what you're talking about, we will receive also these ballot um, items. And the mayor, I think, will be here at seven, you know, soon to talk about this in details. But both of them are right. Thank you. Yeah. Just, um, some have strings, some have not. The, the bond resolution we passed does ask the city to look to see if there are federal funds that can be used, but that's really in flux, and we can't answer today and whether that money can be used for, say, streets and paving. So it's on the mind of the counselors, but. Um, I think we still need to hear about the federal government and the other work needs to get done. And can I just add very briefly that that survey um, is um, one that everybody should fill out. I think there's about 1,600 uh, responses so far. I mean, in addition to multiple choice, there's some open-ended um, boxes that you can fill in if you have additional input. And I would encourage people, and I've heard from constituents that say, well, I want to I want to ask about other things. That's your opportunity to do that as well. So everybody should fill it out. And look for I posted about it on Front Porch Forum maybe a little less than a week ago. I saw it there, Mark, and I completed it. It didn't take long at all. And you are able to put it in other thoughts too. Sylvia? Then we're gonna move on to some school board. Uh, two questions. One is, what was the event on Friday afternoon on North Avenue, Mark? Um, it is a park naming ceremony at 311 North Avenue. The park will be in the Yes. At, at 3 p.m.? At 2 p.m. 2 p.m. 2 p.m. Thank you. Oh, is it on the waterfront? 
No, it, uh, I, I'm not exactly sure. They say that there's parking at um, Liberty House. Um, so I'm mean, imagine it's part of the Cambrian, just behind the Cambrian rise uh, complex. My other question is, uh, I don't think that we have received this survey in, the, in Ward 7. Um, I'm not, it, was it handed out door by door? Because yes, I, through mail. I think I received mine yesterday and sometimes by Friday you wish to receive it. Check your mail. Check okay. your front porch forum post, uh, post, uh, post on Sunday or Monday as well. Okay. Certainly is online. Uh, Bridget got a mailing specific to her, but not everybody was mailed a mailing. Um, so if you want to get it, you need to go online to get it. Um, so I think that's what I mean. The, and I think Ali was referring to the ballots, which we sh should have gotten, but you were not mailed the survey. It, you should try to search for it online. Okay, online. Yeah. But thank you. Yeah, so I think what I was referring to is what Bridget just showed us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, it's also a mailing that they sent. It's about the survey. And, you know, uh, Sylvia, I can also find the survey online and send it to you via email. That okay. would be good. Yeah, and thank you for all your communication. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. We'll move on to school board. Kendra, welcome. Thanks for being here. You're our school board representative tonight. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, things have been really busy at the schools this fall. It's nice to be up and running in person. And uh, we do look forward to the vaccines being rolled out for our younger age groups of, of children very soon. So that'll be great. The update to BHS BTC, which I have for you, we received um, a status update at our facilities and finance meeting about a week ago from our consultants who are white and dark. And it was regarding the three sites that we had kind of narrowed down our our uh, our sites to, which it's actually really two sites in your mind, probably. The, the one site, which is our old high school, has two potential areas to build, the north and the south part of that, that land. And then the other site was the gateway block that includes the Memorial Auditorium. So from that meeting, our consultants presented um, lots of statistics, but basically it boiled down to it's going to cost significantly more to build downtown and it would take longer in their estimation. We do have documents that we posted with complete, all those complete um, information that we got and that's on our board doc system if anyone is interested, which is found on our BSDBT website. The next Tuesday, we have a school board meeting and we are going to be um, looking at the recommendation that Superintendent Tom Flanagan is bringing to us about which site that he and his team would recommend. And we are hoping to vote at that school board meeting as to which site we're gonna move forward on to build the high school. So that's a, that's a big, big update. Um, the Burlington School District Office of Equity is rolling out another series of equity-based workshops that are open to everyone in the community. I did post those to um, Front Porch Forum and they're also on our website and I'll continue to use Front Porch Forum to try to tell you guys when there's anything of interest to the community. This is for BSD families, students, and community members. So we encourage everybody to participate. Right now the board is working to renew Superintendent Flanagan's contract and we're looking to renew it for three years. We'll also be voting on that at the next Tuesday's school board meeting. And we've been working really, really hard to address um, what we see as the inequitable distribution of education dollars from the education fund um, at the state level. And as we've discussed in previous meetings, but for anyone who's new, um, our current funding formula uses weights. So we use weights to adjust for educating students who need more resources. So for example, our English language students or students in poverty require ex extra resources. So the state gives us some extra money for those students. We get more money for high schoolers. For example, they cost more to educate than elementary school kids. And those weights haven't been updated in 20 years. So it's, they're really outdated. And so we're working um, to have them be adjusted. And there was a report that was published um, jointly by UVM and Rutgers 
that use national data to kind of help us see what the model should be. And that was presented to the legislature. And the legislature now has a task force that is looking at how to implement this. Um, their proposal is to separate ELL and to put it into categorical aid. And this is a big concern for those of us that have been working on this project because um, we feel like it should be part of the education funding formula. So there is a public comment uh, meeting that I just wanted to share to everyone who's interested in this issue. We could really use voices for Burling from Burlington. It is this Friday from 11 to 1. And um, if you'd like to sign up, we have created a, there's a nonprofit um, site that you can go to to get, to get more information. And also there's an easy button to sign up. You can send an email or if you'd like to testify, everything's via Zoom, you don't have to go in person. Um, and that website is www.cvtse.org. So I'll say that again, it's, it's C vtse.org if anyone is interested or you just reach out to me and I'm happy to answer any other questions that you may have. So I think that's all the updates I have. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Jeff Comstock. Hi, Kendra. Uh, thank you. Um, one of the questions I've had right along about the per pupil waiting study and the conversation is uh, we're always hearing that students of poverty, English language learners, rural students, um, you know, and minority communities are lumped into this category of misweighted, you know, per pupil spending and the my, my basic question is, as part of that conversation, has there ever been any discussion about what are the unique characteristics of each of those student pools that might be different and could be addressed differently without painting all of those categories with the same brush? Thank you. So that's a really good question. And just so you know, um, each of those categories is looked at differently and is assigned a totally different weight. Um, and they, they're, the weights are supposed to be for the cost of educating that particular group. So there's also a weight for small schools because they don't have the resources, for example, that a large community has. So there has the purpose of the weights is to do exactly that, is to account for the, the different amount of money that it costs to educate and, and be sure that every person in every different category has the same opportunities for learning and being successful. So the weights are totally different for each category. I hope that makes sense a bit. All right, well, thank you. I, I feel like that distinction is kind of gotten lost in this conversation along the way? Yeah, yeah, well thank you for raising that. Yeah, there's definitely different different ways. And you know, to your point, they really should be looked at every couple of years because everything always changes in education every couple of years. So the, the point of it not being updated in over 20 just goes to show you then that these numbers really um, are not, um, they're not accurately reflecting the cost that we have to educate them and in particular for Burlington because we educate ELL we have a high high population of ELL and kids living in poverty and so it is a big deal for us that those weights have not been been updated because we we believe that we're losing a, a fair portion of, of money from the education funding uh, formula from this from the state all right thank you Kendra so, Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Kendra. And um, we'll move on to our state reps, Carol Lodi and Tom Cooper. Carol, do you want to lead us off? You're muted too, Carol. Sure. First of all, thank you to Kendra, Martin, and everybody else on the school board who has been work who have been working so hard on this. Um, it was when I first walked into the legislature that I submitted bills and pushed hard to get this waiting study. And um, 
it's 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 um it's coming to a head now. So um, uh, whatever you can do to uh, to help Kendra and the school board get this, you know, being um, speaking to other state reps would be very helpful. That's number one. Number two. So today, um, this morning, I was able to meet with a small group of people with um, our congressional delegation via Zoom, and we met with one office at a time, and we met with everybody in the offices who um, have expertise in veterans affairs, defense, foreign policy, and national security. So what I um, brought up was that <clears throat> We know we have the F-35s in this area and the federal government um, provides a 90% match when we put up 10% um, to soundproof homes and buildings within a certain uh, sound uh, area around the airport that is most impacted by sound. But um, I requested today that they, those offices do as much as they can to uh, um, push that area out to include more houses and more buildings so that more of those uh, homes can be soundproofed. And um, so that soundproofing also acts as weatherproofing and help, will help with uh, people with their utility bills and will help with climate. Um, another thing I brought up was um, that our city and other cities across the nation, so this is something cities have in common, are absolutely at a critical point regarding um, mental illness and regarding hom homelessness. And that, you know, we have people on streets and cities who are just desperate to where, for where they would go. And I asked for any extra additional help or guidance they can give in terms of that issue. Then um, I also uh, talked to them about um, uh, sexual assault in the military. In we in Vermont are the only people who, who where the legislature actually votes on who the adjutant general will be, and. Um, in our the last election for adjutant general, uh, the a main platform of the current adjutant general was to deal with um, sexual assault in the military. So um, we are working with the adjutant general, um, who's putting out reports to uh, to make sure that um, we keep on top of this and I asked for whatever help they could give us in terms of research and so forth on that. Um, we're actually making quite a bit of progress in Vermont, but of course it's not, there's a lot still to do. Um, and then I brought up with Senator Leahy's uh, own office only, the um, need that we have to deal with our schools and other buildings in our states, but certainly Burlington High School, which has a PCB problem, as we all know, and um, what what funding we may be able to get for that. Um, and um, I did uh, hear that uh, Leahy, Senator Leahy, has met with EPA administrators uh, to talk about money set aside for schools especially, and um, uh, we'll see what the budget ends up having in it, but we're hoping for uh, that it will have a 20 to 40 billion dollar pot of money for the states for that. And then, um, oh, there's another thing. Oh, what was it? Well, oh, nurses and mental health care needs psychiatric nurses, but nurses are needed overall. And we know if you've seen this in the paper, but um, I know I'm on the board of UVM, and uh, as soon as I got onto that board, I said, why, let's get more nurses educated. And we found out that um, 
clinical placements for nurses is a stumbling block there. So there's more than one stumbling block there, but that's a huge stumbling block. And uh, the congressional delegation is aware of it and is working on that. So we could have more nurses coming out of our education institutions. So those are some of the things that we talked about this morning, and I'm so glad to be here tonight. And there's more going on, and I'm working on water issues with Sylvia. I know you haven't heard from me just more recently, but it's not that I'm not working on some of those issues. That, and I wanted to say, you know, there are some clean water issues that we have in our neighborhoods, the three acre stormwater permit, the uh, testing for um, certain chemicals, Sylvia, that you're interested in, and Bridget, the three acre stormwater, those are things that could be put into the surveys for what to do with $15 million in Burlington. You know, they're 50 million is a lot. I think maybe we can get some funding set aside for some of those issues. So thank you, Bob. I don't know, Bob's got a competing um, meeting, but he might not be here. I think he's on, Bob, are you there? Oh. Yeah, I'm back, uh, Jeff right. Davison. Okay. Jeff gave us a time range. Uh, thank you, Carol. Carol hit on a lot of the stuff that's on my list, too. Um, particularly, uh, I spent yesterday and today uh, at a meeting with the Vets Home Board of Trustees. Uh, we've been talking about bringing some job opportunities to Chittenden County, the Chittenden County uh, general area, and maybe opening up a uh, Vets Home subgroup in, in Burlington. Richmond, someplace in the county, because there are a lot of veterans who are 65 and up here. Um, one of the things that's really impacting that decision and that uh, trail of jobs coming here is the fact that nursing and nurses' aides and techs are um, really hard to come by. So when Carol talks about UVM and moving program standards forward, we also need to talk to some degree about Secretary of State and the uh, nursing classifications and LPN, uh, things like that, and maybe move towards a situation where uh, people can job share more uh, and maybe make advantage of uh, positions that might open up more employment opportunities here. Um, a huge issue is the infrastructure bill, if it ever gets passed. Um, as, as with the other federal bills, uh, we get a, a much larger chunk than our population would normally uh, a, a lot to us. So uh, that's just like money in the bank for us. And it's something that I think we definitely need from stormwater to our bridges to our roads. Um, it's going to be a, a, a great thing. Um, I, I was going to write something a couple days ago because everybody on my television from Joe Namath to J.J. Uh, Walker of piping Medicare Advantage plans, which uh, I think are, are being really mismarketed. And I, I really want to warn people that they should take a really serious look at what they offer as opposed to what they expect. Uh, they are heavily managed care. There's nothing worse than getting a serious disease and finding your insurance company says, oh, we don't cover that. Um, standard Medicaid or Medicare is a very good program. Don't jump before you do your homework. Um, on a city level, I'm very happy to hear we reach some kind of resolution on the staffing of the police department issue. Uh, quite frankly, we don't need a lot more things that are dividing us, and that seemed to be a big one. Um, Carol and I think I both. Uh, are going to come up against a hard deadline pretty soon for submission of legislative bills. So if you have something in the back of your head that you want to talk about uh, that might get on the wall of some committee this year, uh, reach out to us soon because usually there are a lot of things going on and getting something in the hopper pretty quickly it is a, uh, a good thing. Um, I, I can't emphasize enough what I think Carol touched on. Uh, the virus it has not gone away. In, case it's, in many cases, it's worse than it was a year ago. Um, it's different. It's more virulent. It's more serious. 
Um, it's hitting people who have avoided vaccination a lot more than people who have gotten it, but it doesn't really care. I continue to urge people to uh, look at this seriously, mask. Uh, I'm kind of disappointed as somebody that really went out on the front porch and, and praised Governor Scott and the Commissioner of Health for doing what they really needed to do last year. And it's, it's disappointing to me that they're, well, the governor is the leader of the ship, um, standing there basically saying, I don't know why everybody's getting sick, but I'm not willing to, to create another emergency situation so we can uh, put more control on things. But school nurses and teachers are really demonstrating that a lot of kids are getting sick. Uh, this is our future. I think uh, caution is probably better than anything else that we could use. So it, it would be a good thing, I think, if the governor stepped up. A lot of us are putting pressure on his office to move off the dime on this. Uh, I'd love to hear your opinion. Um, but that, coupled with the new school formula commission that's going to do things, going to have a big impact on uh, what we do education-wise here, uh, talk to anybody you know around the state and get them to advocate with their representatives to move this forward because even though Chickland County is heavily weighted in the legislature we can always use more help other places um, <clears throat> one of the things that um, oddly enough we talked about at the vet's home meeting today was child care um, and uh, Representative uh, Uber, I'm, I'm so sorry to... to jump in. We just were a little over time and we're cutting into the redistricting um, section. Is there district. anything burning that folks needed to to add or Representative, did you want to add anything particularly burning? Just I apologize to cut you off. No, no, no. The last thing that I was going to mention was redistricting. So it's a, it's so that that serve as an introduction. Well, before, okay, thank, you before, for your thank you, Evan. Before we go there, we have a question from the Miller Center. Ed? Peter. Peter, I'm sorry. Thank you. I understand that the city or, or somebody is doing sophisticated sound monitoring in three locations in Burlington. I hope the results of that test will be used in how much we spend on soundproofing. Uh, I didn't hear the last word. Um, what was spend on what? On soundproofing. Soundproofing. So apparently, uh, there's uh, Peter mentioned there's three locations in Burlington where they're doing sound testing, and he yeah he's hoping that the the soundproofing money that Carol spoke about will be correlated with those test results. I would urge you to get the results of those sound tests. Yeah to our congressional delegations offices. I know. Yeah, and they, the they, can then, they can then work with the federal people who are in charge of drawing those maps. Um, Representative Odie, there's actually quite a few people who comment about this topic regularly um, in the, the New North End Facebook group. And some of those folks may be who um, who is being referred to, and it came up again today that that, that folks would like to see um, in your neck of the woods actually uh, some some assessment and monitoring there. So thank you for bringing that up. Is there an email address that that you think would be the best email address for people to direct um, information like this to? You say the uh, congressional delegation. If you go to uh, the website for each of our our two senators and our congressmen mm -hmm. and we'll see it says uh, send an email and you can write down the information in there and um, that way their office will can can get back to you and and uh, connect you with the right person in their offices if you don't get any response then please just uh, get it to me and i will get it to them okay thank you so much and you can call, it's 202-224-2131, get you to all three of them. Okay, I have a question for uh, Bob Hooper. Oh. Um, so Bob, you did bring up the word redistricting, but I think that there was a little bit of confusion. Um, I th think that you're talking about state redistricting, and is that the case? 
Um, the whole nine yards. Robert. Well, okay. I think uh, I I can only be talking about city redistricting, and so I think that if you have something to say about state redistricting, now is the time. Uh, this, the, the proposal that has come out is a radical change, and I think we really need to look at it critically in terms of um, basically how it works now and if the change is going to be disruptive. Okay, that's very brief. <laughs> Jeff, back to you. All right, um, we will move on to our next topic. Um, as we're already into it quite a bit with the time slot. Um, we're talking about the ad hoc redistricting committee that's been put together. We have representatives um, of the committee and our alternates. I don't believe Lee's here. I think she had a conflict with tonight. Um, but we have Jim Hallway, Robert Briscoe Johnson, Jeff Comstock, and um, we're gonna get started on, um, you had a planning mini meeting yesterday, and um, could you let us know what occurred at that meeting? And there are a series of meetings that you're getting public input, and um, we wanted to give public input tonight as well. So, Jim and um, Robert? Sure. Yeah, sure. Jim, start. Um, sure, so yesterday's meeting was intended to kind of figure out the process that our committee would do. We have uh, we have three public meetings that will occur. The first will be November 1st, and it will be at Conference Auditorium 6 to 8. The second will be at the Miller Center on November 17th, 5 to 7. PM uh, and the third one, the location is yet to be announced, but that is December 6th. So where the location, we'll figure out the location. So there are the, the, the sort of thing that we have. We've had two meetings actually. The first, uh, the first was a presentation to be sure that the committee understood our charge, which is. Um, to engage the community on uh, a number of questions around the way that we vote, whether uh, questions such as um, such as the, let's see, uh, you know, do we do we worry about preserving incumbency? Um, is that should that be a factor? Um, keeping the current number of wards, keep districts, um, should areas. Uh, large student population be um, broken up or kept it into a specific ward like uh, had occurred in the previous time. Um, keep neighborhoods intact at large city councilors, um, even odd number of councilors, uh, multiple representatives per ward. Those are the sort of questions that we're hoping to hear thoughts on from the community. Our job then is to, to gather um, both through the, the committee as a whole in those three public meetings or individual wards can, can find other methods to, to gain input as well. So in the new North End, uh, we jumped on getting a, a, res a, um, a survey out and available to people through, um, it's, a, it's a Google form and it essentially, that survey is the, the questions that we believe the city councilors are looking for input on. Um, it does not ask you questions like, where would you like the lines to be drawn, <laughs> or uh, that sort of thing. That's uh, the, the line drawing and the actual decisions about these elements are to be done after our committee has done our work. So we, we, get, we gather through a survey that um, uh, I've put the, the link out on uh, Front Porch Forum and the Facebook uh, New North End uh, community page there. Um, the decision last night was to go with a standard survey that will, um, so that it'll be consistent across the city. Uh, the, 
in its draft form last night, we didn't we didn't conclude as to what the survey would be. That will be in parallel to the to the listening sessions, if you will, the public listening sessions. That survey currently is about 15 pages. So there's a little bit of work to be done to kind of call that down to a reasonable size. And that's I think I touched on everything. Can you think of anything else, Robert, to add to that? Well, it probably should be noted that that I think that there's no chance that there will be a a a new map question for city for the city charter change on this coming spring ballot. I think that that is just not going to happen. That was originally, I think, the plan of the city council informing the committee. But I I think that they were too optimistic in in believing that we could you know collect the information and do the do what could happen in this shorter period of time because they really have to start acting to put that on the ballot in December and in January to put it on the ballot. I I would say that. Uh, there are some differing perspectives on, on what can be done in terms of the um, uh, uh, in terms of collecting information because the the um, the questions that we're asking uh, of people to weigh in on um, are interlocked are interrelated and it doesn't necessarily uh, mean specifically where the lines fall but uh, one of the important questions is uh, what people feel about uh, um, uh, preser preserving neighborhoods or def defining neighborhoods and how um, how wards themselves um, are related to neighborhoods and um, so I want to say something about what I said last month was it last month at the NP was it last month or two so I said something based on some false faulty information um, we didn't have I didn't have yet the specific um, uh, uh, census data yet uh, last month and I was um, in conversation with um, uh, our mapping specialist uh, uh, with the city and I misunderstood him uh, uh, I mean there is the, the the current population shift is enough out of whack that we will have to redistrict that's f certain because we are more than 10 percent out of whack with some wards uh, namely ward one is a little bit uh, more populous and ward seven is a little less is a little not populous enough but um i misunderstood him to think that the entire new north end was light and the fact is that the entire um wards four and ward seven together the north district is still within 10 percent in fact it's a it's within five percent of being exactly one quarter of the city uh, and what that means is that it is still possible with um, uh, what would be either a four ward uh, map or an eight ward map it is still possible to have um, the uh, uh, old north end and the new north end to be distinctly uh, uh, separate from each other whereas if for if the new north end wasn't ten, uh, one fourth of the city, if, if so, like said, let's say we were, you know, uh, one fifth of the city or 22 percent of the city, that would throw that out the window. There would just be no way that we we're doing that. And so I said something kind of rash that was uh, uh, not correct. It turns out it was. Uh, I knew it was rash, but I said that probably Ward Seven would not exist as we know it. All I can say now is that if um, we have five wards or six wards or seven wards, then ward seven won't be the same as we know it. But the fact is we don't necessarily have to go that way because uh, uh, the, uh, the North District uh, wards four and seven still comprise one quarter of the city. And that's, that's an important fact to know. So uh, 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 um, I just wanted to clarify what I was said last month, and I, uh, I don't think I'm going to say much more about it because I don't want to put my foot in my mouth again. <laughs> so, um, and Jeff, did you have some additional thoughts before we start listening to what 
people to have for questions and answering those specifically? Uh, yes. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, earlier in October, I participated in a League of Women Voters uh, conference on uh, redistricting with uh, Tom Little from the state districting, st the legislative districting uh, work group. And he had some interesting perspective on that 10% rule that not necessarily as hard and fast as is often discussed. So it will be interesting to see how the, you know, the deviation from the population numbers plays out uh, later on in this process because um, apparently that 10% rule is not established in statute, if I'm... Not in statute. You know, so... So apparently, so anyway, the the just the the bottom line of, of his perspective and the legislative districting committee is through experience is that uh, if municipalities implement sort of a, a larger plus or minus variance in those population factors for uh, reasons that uh, the city supports that courts are very likely are unlikely to override those variances so there is a possibility down the road that however the city draws the maps that we apparently we do have some leniency in how those boundaries are drawn without being shoehorned into that 10 percent rule so just keep the perspective that there is some potential flexibility in how this turns out down the road. Right, the, the, um, we're, the data that we have right now is not uh, not the final data, but we're at 17%. The legal counsel from the city on that particular point is that the farther you get from the 10% or under, the more likely it is that you're, you're um, putting yourself, your, your municipality out there for questions. So um, if you do it, um, it, I mean, all, all indications are that we're far enough that either we do or we don't. And I, I think that the, 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 with 17, unless numbers significantly change from what, what the, the presumption was in uh, a month ago, um, we, we probably are moving forward to that. So there, so I want to put out, I guess the other um, thing is, is that um, aside from where the, how the numbers play out, the, the idea of redistricting for those who aren't familiar is to ensure that every, in representative government, every seat represents roughly the same number of people. And, and so there's equity in, uh, in representative government. So that's what the, those percentages are about. And if, if one ward were uh, much, much larger than, uh, the, say, another, the smallest ward, then, uh, then you don't really have that equity. So that's the goal. So I, I believe that uh, some of the intent this cycle is to engage us in, in sort of a, a broader conversation about you know, we've, we've done uh, the voting the way we have, other than uh, moving to an eighth district, um, that all of our, our dynamics have remained the same. And then the question for you all is, um, you know, we can we can preserve closely and do, do some line, recommend line adjustments, um, or we can go radically in a different direction. And that's part of the, the kind of conversation is um, and then the, the last piece here is um, to remember that all of the work that, that this committee do, is doing is advisory and, and informs whatever the next step is. So it is quite possible, I think Robert was alluding to, the idea that you, you might, uh, you, the community might uh, like two different um, 
elements like let, let's say we want an odd number of of counselors and uh, you know you can't make that work with an even number of counselors per ward and you have you know so those are sort of things that that will get sorted out later in the data but right now it's about engaging the, the conversation um so with that unless uh, either robert or jeff would like to add it really like to just hear what questions people have or thoughts people have uh with regard to the municipal redistricting if, if if I can if I can just add a little, uh, um, I I thought that the numbers were that Ward One was 11 percent high from the mean, and that Ward Seven was nine percent, almost 10 percent below the mean or below the ideal. So I I thought that they were telling us that our our disparity was 21 percent and not 17. But I don't know. I'll have to look at the numbers again. Uh, um, uh, right. we're, we're still still waiting for final numbers, so any right. of that is a moot point. Um, um, well, it's not moot. If it was 17, we would not be forced by the courts. Uh, if we were plus, if we were less than plus or minus 10 percent from the worst to the, the worst, we might not be forced by the courts to redistrict. But if we are, if we do exceed that, we may be forced by the courts to redistrict. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say, though, that about uh, the, the, if we if the city chooses to be incremental about it, the mistake that I made last month was I said that it was impossible to be incremental about it, which was false. It is possible to be incremental about it. It is possible to nudge the lines and to go on as we had before. But it's not necessary. We don't have to do that, and we maybe shouldn't do that. That's all uh, to be decided. But the possibility of nudging the lines is there. Uh, namely, a little bit of Ward 4 would have to go into Ward 7, and a little bit of Ward 1 would have to go into Ward 2, and we'd be back within the, the easily within the 10% thing. That's all I want to well, say. So I'd like to hear from, from the community some thoughts or questions. I don't hear anything. Slow down, slow down. <laughs> you know, I, I often, um, you know, I heard the comment about that there would be, um, you know, perhaps four disc wards instead of eight. Um, and, you know, that sounded great to me because I, the, division or the line of North Avenue between Ward 4 and 7, um, I view um, the new North End as, you know, both. And, um, you know, I, that so that sounded great to me that it would be one ward, um, you know, and not divided. Um, could that come to be? It, it, it certainly can be, but if we're going to be consistent throughout the city, uh, then there would be three other large wards like that. Uh, um, the, with the rest of the city, where the lines fall would be much more arbitrary. Uh, uh, I mean, it could be anywhere. But with us in the New North End, uh, um, there's a bottleneck, and, and it's currently where the North District ends right now. Uh, 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 there wouldn't be much other way of drawing the lines. Uh, up in the new north end but for the rest of the city sir we could have a four uh, and that was one of the plans offered eight years ago uh, um, I think that uh, Joan Shannon was uh, uh, um, uh, 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 promoting that plan and uh, you know we could have four big wards and three counselors each and that would be 12 counselors that's a possibility but we don't have it so bad here at the Miller Center I, I work also on the on on Ward Seven as a uh, uh, as a poll worker, and I used to be an inspector of election. Um, but I once visited the Ward Three. Uh, and, uh, in fact, I met Charlie there, uh, and they had lines coming out the door when we did not. And so, one of the disadvantages of large wards may be what happens in their polling places. That's that's the the flip side. That's all I wanted to say. To, con to weigh that against. Okay. Uh, Carol, you had a question? I wanted to comment? say, I haven't looked at the maps and the city thing, so, but when, when you have a, a big, big area to cover and you're running for office, it's very hard to hit all the houses. And um, 
I know I knock on the doors of um, almost every house and it's it takes me months so I just I would say for the city instead of three people having to run in such a huge area you know cut the area up but that uh, in fact I don't want to say what I think the solution should be I just want to say it's expensive and time-consuming to run in a large area right. so please think about that yep we certainly are thinking about that hi um this is actually maricela constantino First, I wanted to, that's okay i wanted to thank jim and robert for um your efforts on this committee because i think it was really it was nice to hear that the committees come together and decided to um, provide a standardized um survey because i think that will just ensure that we're hearing and everyone's being treated the same way and, and learning the same um, I'm curious about, and this may be too early, but um, I'm curious about the formatting for the listening sessions. Um, you know, as someone who doesn't have a ton of experience and how, uh, like, implications for changes, will there be some kind of um, sort of neutral presentation about, you know, in, informing people either before or at the listening session before? people start getting their um, opinions? Because I think, you know, not everybody has the expertise or the experience in this that, that you all do. Right, uh, so the, the two key components are to, to educate the, the community a little bit about what the, the implications are. So you, you, you right on the head there. Um, so on the front end of a listening session will be a presentation that will be as uh, you know, sort of neutral as possible without kind of influencing one way or another. That's the goal on the presentations and the listening sessions. On the survey, the, the survey, again, uh, we're looking at the questions to be sure that they really are not leading one way or another. And uh, part of the intent of the survey is to give a little bit of information about what the question means. Uh, and that sort of thing. So, but given that that uh, we we want to make sure that we do a, a good job of presenting enough information so that people can speak w with some good understanding. But the predominant part of the meeting will be to be listening. So you will really you wouldn't hear much from committee members. We we really like to hear the different uh, conversations that go along and, and really engage the community on. On the, the thoughts back and forth and um, we certainly can answer questions like implications of full awards versus uh, a larger number just as as our representative Odi mentioned that um, the, the smaller the number of wards the, the the more difficult it is as a constituent to to reach your um, your elected official or certainly in the campaigning it does if the wards are too large then it, it sort of uh, um, precludes people who with, with lesser means to be able to reach out to the entire ward so though it's an example of somebody brings up a, a question or a point you could offer a response that way but the predominant part is to, to capture in those two primary paths the, the survey and we're, we're aiming to get that out in paper form and electronic form uh, so that we can get available to, to people who, who may not be able to have electronic means. Does that answer your question or your question? Yeah, no, I think it does, thank you. And I think um, it just prompts just another just point I wanted to make is if it's at all possible, um, because it does sound like those listening sessions are a balancing act of providing opportunities for the public to, to speak. Uh, but if for those who might be interested in, in coming prepared, you know, and for doing their homework, if that survey or some other um, information can be shared with the public prior to those events so that people who do want to look into it can, um, I think that would be great. Uh, it'd be really helpful to have that kind of, so that you're, you know, you're getting an informed uh, public coming in. Um, that's good. good. Go ahead, Jim. Um, so yeah, the, the goal today was a, a deadline to get a, a piece in the community newspaper, formerly known as a 
North, North Avenue News, but now it goes to every, every household in the city. And we were hoping to have an educational piece in there. So I'm not really sure if they were able to, to, to hone that down well enough. So we'll see what's in there. The other uh, option that, uh, that I've provided is to do coffees, uh, you know, or at the, um, either at the Bagel or, or somewhere else here in, town, in, in the area where if you want to engage more questions and that sort of thing, so there'll be that. So we'll, um, but I do like to take your point that the more educational materials we can get out there, the better. Um, Robert or, or Jeff, was there anything that you wanted to add to those? I, I just wanted to say that that, that the the um, the fact is that the questions um, that people have and the, and the, the, there are competing um, properties or competing goals that we have in redistricting that sometimes they just can't all be uh, uh, met and um, and it is difficult to be specific about saying what these are in educating people without then getting, you could say enough in the weeds that you might start be hinting at, at a preference, you know, and, I, and I've been trying to steer clear of that, but I, I just, I did feel that this thing about the, um, the four ward versus and eight ward possibilities um, and that relationship with the old North End and the new North End, that, that's kind of a hard fact that I think that people should know about uh, uh, when they when they um, weigh in with their opinions, uh, uh, um, and it is just simply it's one of the persons in the, the legislative apportionment board. This is the state redistricting board. Um, they compared it to squeezing a balloon, and um, it it is just simply impossible to have a five ward map or a six ward map or a seven ward map and have the old north end and the new north end uh, be in, in, in different wards. Um, it is only with that, the four ward and the eight ward map and I do believe that people should know that in advance uh, uh, when they, when they uh, uh, deal with the questions. That's pro possibly a disagreement within the committee about, about that because it's uh, you know, it's a specific fact that's true, but it is also not neutral. Well, um, are there any other input or questions for um, the group? And if not, we'll move on to our next topic. Thank you um, for the members of the ad hoc committee for the work you've done and you will be doing. Um, we appreciate it. Uh, we'll move on to our next topic, um, the Burlington Capital Plan. Um, I, I, we mentioned earlier in the meeting about the ballots coming in, so it's a timely topic to talk about um, that we'll all be voting on. And I will pass it over to Mayor Weinberger to um, give us the details on why we should vote yes on this ballot item. Thank you for being here, Mayor. Great, thank you, Jeff. Um, you hearing me okay? Yes, sound good. Okay, great. Um, nice to, to be with you all tonight, and um, I got to catch um, a bunch of those updates, and uh, uh, it's exciting how much is going on, um, and I'm excited to be here tonight to talk to you about uh, this special election, which, of course, uh, if you've seen your ballot, and most people got them uh, in the last couple of days, there are two ballot uh, questions, and I, um, there is the capital, uh, infrastructure bond, um, and there is also a revenue bond for the Burlington Electric Department. And I've got um, presentations, PowerPoints on both of them. I'm going to start with the capital bond, and uh, I've got my TPW vest on for this one. And um, it's uh, let me try. It, it, it's okay if I share a screen here. It's not letting me do that. Is is that possible to uh, to give me that? Should be able to now. Okay, great. Um, here we go. Okay. So this is entitled continuing the city's capital infrastructure plan because, um, really this, 
effort began uh, year, many years ago now. Um, in 2014, we set out to really create a 10 year capital plan for the city for the first time in a very long time. And um, we uh, went through a process, a lengthy process that resulted, kind of culminated in the fall of 2016 with it, the voters weighing in on this. And approximately 78% of the voters supported that sustainable infrastructure plan back then. And it was essentially the first five years uh, of this 10 year plan that was funded at the time. Um, what did we do with that um, $27.5 million of bonding, as well as there were some other sources to that, to that effort as well. All told, it, it added up to approximately 50 million. Um, and, but the general obligation bond went specifically into, uh, these are the highlights. So we, we built more than 14 miles of sidewalks over uh, since 2016, which was about triple the rate of sidewalks um, uh, construction that we had been doing for many years before that. We have installed bike lanes. You know, we, didn't, we didn't totally tailor this presentation for the, the uh, uh, 47 MPA, I know the bike lanes aren't always the most uh, popular idea, but the street, the road work um, is, and we have um, doubled the roads spending investment in the roads over the last five years. The bike path has been uh, nearly um, completed. Seven miles, it says on this slide, the last mile is down in Oak Ledge Park, and if you've been down there recently, you know that we're getting close to finishing that last mile. Um, there has been substantial interest investment in city buildings that have been neglected um, for a long time. The IT infrastructure in the city has been improved dramatically. Um, and um, we have also, so those are, those are some of the highlights of, of what we've done for the last five years. It was always the plan that in about now, we would be coming back for the next five years or the next several years of investment. And uh, the initial plan actually was to come back in, in the fall of, of 2020. And that, uh, there was work that was started towards that and then the pandemic hit and has set this back here, which is one of the reasons for the timing, the unusual timing of this bond. We've already essentially lost uh, a year um, of momentum in what I see as a pretty significant um, generational effort to change the trajectory of our infrastructure and address really decades of deferred maintenance in, in, in a number of areas. And um, as a result of that, the, that delay, we already had significantly less investment this summer than in previous years. You may have noticed that um, already. Uh, by coming forward with this special election, we um, uh, are avoid missing a second, essentially a second year in a row um, of this, this significant investment. Uh, and what the other reasons for coming forward now, uh, there are several. We um, know there is a federal infrastructure bill that is being deliberated right now. Um, and hopefully we'll know soon um, what that, that passes. Um, it will be some months before the rules uh, of this are, are um, written. And so we're in a significant period here uh, where um, it's uncertain exactly what kind of assistance is gonna be coming from the federal government. Typically, any infrastructure money coming from the federal government requires a local match. Often it's competitive. Um, by having local funds that are committed and available to move Quickly, we think we'll be able to secure a larger share uh, of those federal dollars um, uh, if and when the infrastructure bill becomes available. Another benefit of going down that is somewhat uncertain is we are still in these historically low borrowing, uh, the time of historically low borrowing rates that has gone on for many years now, but there's no guarantee of it, of course. And with uh, inflation pressures in the economy and uncertain uncertainty about the economy going forward, um, this uh, this, scene, this may prove to be a really opportune time to be able to act. Um, the um, another uh, point that weighed on me as deciding whether or not to go forward with the plan, as expected, is that 
just last time we checked in with a significant number of voters through a, a, a survey for the FY22 budget, support for infrastructure um, was again very strong, as it has always been in recent years, whenever we have uh, spot support for one area of infrastructure or another. Um, it, this is something that uh, time and again, Burlingtonians have shown they want to improve and, and change and get better at, which I think um, to me makes a lot of sense given the role that public infrastructure plays in our quality of life and in our economy um, and, and how clear it is that our aging infrastructure is in need of investment. Um, See, sorry. There we go. Um, what what will this forty million dollar bond uh, support if if it is approved? There are um, a, n a number of major areas, and I'll let me get down to this. This breakdown, I think, is a, is a little clearer. Here, here is what we're planning. There is substantial investment um, in in streets and sidewalks. Um, at this level, it continues. We would continue for the next three years to um, be at these rates of triple the amount of uh, sidewalk investment we've done historically, double the amount of uh, road investment that we've done historically, and really continue to uh, get those critical assets back on a, on a sustainable trajectory. The, um, in the fleet. Um, section down lower the 2.2 million there is for our the great majority of that is for three new fire engines um, we have replaced two fire engines over the last uh, several years this would get this would have essentially five sixths of the fire uh, of the fire truck fleet um, uh, well resourced again um, whereas if we don't do this we the, the, the fire trucks are, four of them are currently nearing the end of their life. The other public safety infrastructure investment there is, um, it has to do with the radio systems that we use, that our police and our firefighters use to communicate from any corner of Burlington. This is actually something that even a decade into this job, I wasn't totally clear about before um, we started planning for this, uh, this effort. Um, we maintain our own system of, of signal towers and repeaters, and um, without that, there is uh, no way for public safety communications to happen reliably. And we need to make this investment. So it's another critical, critical piece um, there. We, the Burlington is responsible for a number of bridges. We have about uh, 25 major buildings, and then 40 smaller buildings that we're responsible for. All of which have uh, many of which have years of deferred maintenance, and then the, the final item, and I, and I would like to, to speak to this. I think there's there's this is um, an area that, uh, as I've been talking with people about what is in this uh, package that was approved by the council uh, nearly unanimously um, and, and sent to the voters, is a is ten million dollars reserved um, for Memorial Auditorium, and this. Um, is uh, flexible dollars um, in that we, what this would ensure is that finally the city um, takes decisive action with, with Memorial Auditorium uh, and brings resolution to this, uh, this, this building that has been so, so underinvested in for uh, decades that is actually currently closed and, and not usable. Uh, the, this would give the city the ability if, uh, if the school district um, were to choose the downtown site as where we wanted to put a new high school and allow the, the city to be a partner in that. Um, I think there's very, you know, real set possibility that's not going to happen and what this $10 million would do is it would um, allow us to, at, uh, at, at the very least, um, uh, preserve the structural integrity of the building and have the dollars to do that. It is really getting to the point now where if we don't make investment soon, um, we will uh, we risk um, the building coming down and us sort of losing the choice of what happens in the future on that. This would give us the funds to preserve the structural integrity. It would take future action by the city council before um, a further plan of Memorial Auditorium is, is committed to. That is, um, sorry, a couple more slides here. 
to make some a couple more significant points, and then I'll try to uh, pause for for some questions. One, I, I just want to make sure it's clear, to folks, that we are, as we always do, working hard to secure um, as much other funds as possible before coming to property taxpayers for the, the, the final piece of the general obligation bonding. What this shows is that this $40 million plan is one piece of approximately $150 million plan um, that uh, we um, are in the process of implementing over the next three years. It, we have a lot of the, the other dollars come from the federal government here uh, and are committed already in terms of uh, federal transportation projects, um, specifically the Champlain Parkway, the Shelburne Roundabout, Shelburne Road Roundabout project, which is underway, um, and the Rail Yard Enterprise project. Um, we, one uh, part of the bond proceeds I didn't focus on before is that about three and a half million um, of that 40 million is to, for the local matching dollars um, of those federal projects. And so, uh, it is exciting that we have s such a significant amount of federal money that is committed to come this way in the coming years. There is a small local match that is part of that, and, and that is and, and that is part of what you're leveraging with the yes vote um, on this bond. The um, other, um, you can see we're also um, uh, potentially uh, Something that will be in your, in the, your up for your input as well as to use ARPA dollars uh, for some uh, some other uh, infrastructure investment. That's another possible source. And then you can see these are some some of the other sources that the city can access um, for for these other investments. So the bonding is the, is the last piece. Uh, let me see. I think I'm almost. Um, here, this slide is a little bit confusing and I won't take you all the way into the weeds of it, but it, I, I show it here to try to address, I think, the biggest question that I've heard um, about this, rightly, about this effort, which is how can we, um, uh, you know, I, Moreau, people say, okay, I know how important, I agree, local, the, the municipal infrastructure is critical. Um, however, we also have a um, major community uh, crisis, really, um, in that uh, we don't currently have a permanent high school, and the uh, there's a plan coming um, for that, and and how you know what have you done to prepare for that, and what we have, um, and I think it's a totally fair question, the right question to be on people's minds. We have. For years, um, been um, trying to find, really for the first times in the city's history, a way for both the city and the school district to be able to make necessary infrastructure um, investments, capital investments, um, and to do so in a way where both all aspects of these critical in infrastructure is met and we do not put too great of a burden on the community and on taxpayers. And that, that conversation led in 2018 to, for the first time, having a, a, a debt management policy and really an agreement between the school district and the city um, about, about cumulative borrowing, overlapping borrowing. And um, this plan that uh, I just talked to you about is consistent with that and, and um, is, is a proposal that keeps us within uh, the, these limits that are kind of established by our credit rating agency for what, it, what, what, what is a responsible amount of total borrowing um, that communities should take on. And, we wrote the policy to keep us at the, the AA um, rating, and we, um, which is of critical importance from my perspective, and that we worked very hard for the last decade to get back from the edge of junk fund status to a AA rating, and having achieved that has already locked in literally tens of millions of dollars in savings for taxpayers and ratepayers going forward, and we don't want to jeopardize that. So the the, the policy. Um, is a policy about what is responsible borrowing. 
We are, so one thing we know about this is you can vote yes, confident that the city is staying within those uh, metrics. Uh, another thing you can be confident in is that, two other points, more than half of the overall borrowing capacity is being reserved for the school district um, to pursue their borrowing needs and more than, and, and that there is substantial additional capacity that is uh, available above and beyond the $70 million that the school district already um, had planned and secured voter approval for uh, for the high school, which is critical because we all know that the, that the initial plan with the high school is not working out and that we are now facing the need for a new high school, substantially more expensive new construction. And again, what people can be confident in is that there is substantial additional capacity within this, these responsible borrowing metrics uh, for, for the plan when it comes back, which um, uh, and, you know, I know we had Kendra on earlier. Um, the, my expectation is that the school district will be coming back with a, a plan either in the, in the spring uh, or a, a year from now. Um, what is the, and I'll stop after this, what is the total cost? Um, what, what should you be expecting if you vote yes on this? And this is uh, I, something I hope is very much on people's minds as you have the, the ballot in front of you and you're deciding whether or not to vote yes. The average price, there, there is some impact and we have to be um, explicit about that. The, there is no, um, there's no way to deliver a change in our, our infrastructure. There's no way, way to continue with this historic investment we're making in, in infrastructure without some tax impact. I think that impact is a lot less than sometimes people expect it will be. Um, the average price home now after the reappraisal is $380,000 uh, in Burlington, believe it or not. And um, the cost of this $40 million plan when fully drawn down um, will be a, a maximum of uh, about $13 a month or $160 a year. It'll take us several years to, to draw down the funds and get to that point. So you can see on this graph, it kind of maxes out in um, fiscal year 25, and then the cost goes down from there. And that year, the average Burlington, or I think the right, the median Burlington home uh, property owner household uh, would pay about $13 a month for this plan. And um, uh, that is, um, I, know, I know that is a significant uh, commitment. It's certainly a significant uh, on top of all of the other pro property taxes and state and federal taxes that you're responsible for. Um, and I, I, I think everyone has to reach their own um, uh, conclusion about whether uh, this is this is worth it. I guess when I when I look at it and I look at all my tax bills, and to me this is about the best government value that you get for thirteen dollars a month is to have this high quality public infrastructure that um, has such a big role again in our, in our quality of life and in in our and plays such a significant role in our economy. So with that, why don't I I'm gonna stop sharing and. Um, I do have another PowerPoint for the, the, the revenue bond um, with the Burlington Electric Department, but I, I think there may be more questions about this than anything else. So I, I would pause here and uh, maybe Jeff, you can tell me when we have like five minutes left and I'll try to do a quick rundown then of- uh, <laughs> We do have about five minutes left. That's all we got left already, okay. <laughs> but um, we did have um, Darren Springer last month um, okay. to give us a great update on the bond. So. Um, I think we're covered on that topic. Yeah, great. Um, and <coughs> let me go over to questions. Um, Bridget, um, I see you first. Uh, Mayor, thank you. I have uh, one quick question and a, uh, two very quick questions. One is, what does the acronym TIF stand for on your chart? Is it accept TIF? Oh, great. Yeah. Um, tax increment financing. And so this is on the chart that showed different sources of funding. Um, and that is this state economic development program that uh, the city of Burlington has used to really much of the progress that we made on the waterfront over the last um, 30 years through the waterfront, waterfront uh, tax increment financing district. And then we also have a downtown tax increment financing district as well. And, and 
Thank you. So tell me again why, why you ask. Uh, the, 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 those, so those are, we, we are paying for a substantial amount of downtown waterfront infrastructure from those sources, which are uh, essentially the state economic development program. It's a great opportunity for municipalities. That, those are separate um, funds and, and separate efforts from uh, this um, kind of core infrastructure uh, effort that is in this fund. I just wanted to be uh, clear. My second question was uh, the uh, breakdown for taxpayers over, I think, 10 years, you, the chart that you gave. That was, that's only for the $40 million um, general obligation fund for, for infrastructure. It, 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 it is not, uh, it doesn't include the one for electricity infrastructure, and it's probably not uh, including the eventual very expensive bond for our high school. That's right. This the the thirteen dollars a month a month that that, that chart was for the, this forty million dollar core infrastructure sustainable infrastructure um, uh, investment. So this is for the yes the sidewalks and the streets and the municipal buildings um, and the matching funds the federal dollars the the, the BED bond. I mean, the good news there, I'm sure you heard this from Darren last month, is the BD bond is, is, has no impact on your property taxes. That is a bond paid for out of the Burlington Electric Department revenues. And that is an unusual bond in that you can vote for it uh, with the confidence that there is um, very little pr pressure on you, basically no pressure on your electric bills from voting yes for five years. It actually. It's a little complicated, maybe beyond what we have the time for, but actually reduces your electric costs um, over the over the next year and has zero uh, upward pressure for the first five years and very modest pressures after that. And in part, that's because what we're going to pay for with that bond will create new revenues for the Burlington Electric Department. And those new revenues um, from people switching over from gasoline vehicles to electric vehicles, switching over from fossil fuel burning heat to to electric heat. Those new revenues will pay for a lot of that bond, plus we're retiring debt there. So people can vote for that one. That one is you can be really confident that that uh, it's going to do good things for the world and this community, and have be very little new dollars out of your your pocket. The, the we're going to move on to the next question, Evan. Yeah, I guess thanks, thanks so much, Jeff. Um, well, I'll try to keep it quick. I just thank you, Bridget, for your last question. Um, that was very helpful for me as well. Um, so the first question I have really is about um, the memorial fund, the $10 million, which is 25% of the bond, which I, I noticed was the last item listed on your um, slide. And you mentioned the school again. Um, and so it's been made pretty clear that that's not the ideal location for, by, by both the, the folks who have come in and done the assessment and the school board has come out and said it's going to be more expensive to put it down. So when we're being asked to consider all these expenses, I wonder if you want to clarify your comments about the potential to use Memorial for the high school and how you see this fits into the bond conversation tonight. Yeah, fair. Thank you, Kevin. I do appreciate the opportunity to try to be as clear as possible about this. Um, the I think it's urgent that we allocate. If, if I don't want to be the mayor that, after decades of neglect, um, presides over this building like literally falling down, and there's increasing risk uh, that 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 could that could happen. Um, we have reached the point where we need to make substantial investment in the building um, or or we're going to lose it as a building and this 10 million dollars would uh, certainly give us the funds to make urgent urgent repairs um, that preserves the, the structural integrity of the building um, and what we do it also gives us some dollars beyond that to do to do, um, really bring it back to life as an important downtown building. There are a number of options for that, and that was my point in raising it as a school possibility before. I agree with you, it sounds, I, 
unlikely that that is what the decision that, that, that it is. I think this is a decision that's going to be made quite soon by the district, and it sounds increasingly unlikely that that will be where it is. Um, what, uh, but it, if somehow that changed, this would be funds available for that. If that is not what what happens, we there will be further community process um, uh, and decision by the the the. the, the the council after community input about what we are going to do with the future of that building and this this ten million dollars would give us um, the, the ability to both preserve the building make sure that um, uh, it doesn't fall down and give us the um, ability to bring it back back to life if it's something that we choose yeah. so um, you know that's why it's included in, I think it, we're, we're reaching the end of the time we have to make a decision about that. And I, when we have polled Burlingtonians in the past, they made it very clear. Something like 80% of uh, Burlingtonians in the survey we did a couple years ago um, wanted to keep the building and wanted us to find a way to return it to something like its historic use. Um, this gives us uh, the ability to, to, to make good on those desires. Okay, thanks. And then the last thing I just uh, wanted to ask is, you know, some folks have brought up concerns about the growth of the general obligation debt. Um, particularly, it's it's doubled and over doubled since you took office, and it's now last at 162 million. For folks who are concerned about the general obligation debt and where we're at and where we're going, what what would you say to them? Yeah, no, I appreciate the chance. I mean, what I would I would raise again then with the point I was trying to make with that kind of complicated graph there. We um, we we've been very intentional about uh, uh, creating a policy to ensure that we don't borrow too much from the perspective of what is a responsible level of total borrowing from the city and the school district combined um, and. What, what Moody's does is it looks at that from a couple different perspectives, from, from what is the, uh, the amount of borrowing you're doing relative to your revenues, and what is the amount of borrowing that you're doing relative to the, the total uh, size of your tax base. And on both metrics, um, the plan has us within the, in the AA rating, which is as high a rating as we've ever had historically. And this was just tested again recently Moody's did another evaluation, kind of our annual review, and they know that both the school district and the city are, are coming forward with additional borrowing, and they reaffirmed our AA rating and uh, essentially complemented the, man the, the debt management. So um, that, that increase, it is true, and we are investing, and I see that, and I know that that can kind of sound alarming, but there's been a doubling in, in debt. Um, what, uh, the, um, I see it as, because we're being so intentional about it and because it is part of our overall uh, financial, I actually think it is a, is a part of being fiscally responsible is that we are, is taking care of the assets and the properties that you're responsible before. And we weren't doing that before. Now we're okay, Thank you. I want to just defer to Mr. Comstock's cards there. Thank you. Appreciate your answer. Oh, sorry, I couldn't see you there, Jeff. I, I was okay. uh, sorry. Right. We're all a team trying to manage virtual and, and in person. Okay, thank you, everybody. It's been nice being with you. Thanks, Mayor. Um, now we'll move on to our last topic is Good Group with Brian Cena. Um, Brian, welcome. Um, I was just looking for a little bit to introduce you. Um, Brian serves as a Vermont House representative for Chittenden 6-4. Um, he, and right in his bio as well, is a community organizer and activist, and he co-founded Is Good, Isham Street Gardening and Other Optimistic Doings, a neighborhood organization. So um, I know that when you presented this to other NPAs, they suggested you do it to others. So, you have the floor, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to jump right in and get moving along here. Um, so, can everyone see that? Um, we've got. Yes. Um, I'm going to present to you tonight about uh, a proposed pilot project that, um, that came up through the work of Is Good. But first, I'm going to talk with you about what is Is Good. So, Is Good means Ishan Street Gardening and other optimistic doings. 
So um, we came up with this idea of a neighborhood outreach worker program, and it would be a community development program grounded in transformative justice that will cultivate public Dude, safety. Going, so I I feel, story. Bob, mute yourself. This feels like the legislature right now. Um, so, <laughs> Sorry. So a community development program grounded, <laughs> luckily that's all you said. Um, community development program grounded in transformative justice that will cultivate public safety by building relationships, improving access to social, health care, and economic resources, and growing community competency to manage quality of life issues. And this is inspired by lessons learned through the work of this book. Um, these are some pictures here of our work. These are a, a butterfly visiting the butterfly plants that we put in. You can see a neighbor working with the UVM staff person building the garden. And you can see uh, college students eating kale from a Greenbelt garden while they play basketball. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what is good is, and I may not be able to say a lot about the Neighborhood Outreach Worker Program in nine minutes, but I can give you a little um, idea of what that is, and you can always talk more later. So, Ishan Street um, Gardening and other optimistic doings is a mutual aid and community building project that has transformed Ishan Street over the past 12 years or so from being one of the worst streets in Burlington to being a model for how neighbors can improve their quality of life. Um, you can see here some neighbors gathered with UVM staff at gardening store, and you can see in another picture, Mayor Weinberger with department heads of the city coming to visit us in our early years and listening to our vision, and to your credit, I think you may have left Mayor Weinberger, um, after this meeting, the city repaved our street, put in bump outs, had the city arborist meet with us to put in trees, and has been a partner with us since uh, in, in, in working with us to improve infrastructure in a way that meets um, our vision of creating sort of green streets. So the roots of this good, basically there were three neighbors, me, my neighbor Phil, who was an older gentleman, and my neighbor Sam, who was a college student, started gardening the green belts in front of our house. UVM staff met us and told us we could get a grant because we have student-neighbor partnership. And we started gardening our green belts with neighbors, um, over time, including elders from Burlington Health and Rehab, tenants, landlords, college students, artists, activists, business owners, um, engaging all these different neighbors and creating a vision. Um, and here is the, we had a visioning um, event early on, and here was our five-phase vision, um, the five-phase action plan. We would establish gardens and bump outs on one side of Aishan Street, and phase two would be to do the other side of the street. So you have one street that's completely guarded. We're close to finishing phase three, which is extending the gardens down Hickok Street so that Isham Street and Hickok Street from, um, from Loomis to North Union is a garden walkway. And we're laying down the foundation now for phase four, where we would connect existing rebuilt gardens on Boot, Russell, and Charles Street with Isham and Hickok, creating a garden walkway that extends from North Union to North Willard. And we want to work with the city to create gardening on the corner of Pomeroy Park designed by our neighbors. And phase five, which we are also starting to plant the seeds of, is to work with other community gardens around the city and come up with a plan to be slowly link gardens so that the entire city is a network of garden walkways. Um, and there's more to say about that, but I think we'll save that for the spring when it's time to um, organize around phase five. So <clears throat> we've had a lot of economic and social support. <clears throat> It's, uh, we have the residents of Eichem Street, Hickok, Green, Loomis, Willard, and Booth, staff from UVM, residents and staff from Burlington Health and Rehab, students from UVM, students and staff from Upward Bound. We've had grants from UVM, from the American Association of Retired People, New England Grassroots Environmental Fund, and most recently CETO grants to do this work. So through our, we had unintended consequences. We were doing this just because it felt good and made our street feel better, it made us connect, it, it made things more beautiful. But through the organizing around gardening and good deeds, we improved, we not only improved the physical and social environments, crime rates dropped significantly compared to surrounding streets. And uh, you can see here some pictures of um, some various neighbors, upward bound students with Burlington Ten Health and Rehab residents. And you can see the partnership that exists between people from all different backgrounds who live in the neighborhood united in our effort to garden and to do good things with each other for each other. So um, in 2014, the Burlington Police Department wrote a grant with us um, that would um, bring the knowledge and skills developed 
through the USGIP program to other neighborhoods struggling with quality of life issues. Um, and we didn't get the grant. Um, we've continued our work since, though, with funding from other partners, um, especially CEDO and UVM. And uh, through the pandemic, the Office of Student and Community Relations at UVM, who's our main um, access point to UVM, and is good with support from CEDO, we continue to bring neighbors together in creative ways to improve quality of life and to pr promote public safety as we face tremendous loss in the community. Eleven neighbors died in Burlington Health and Rehab early on in the pandemic, and uh, another neighbor committed suicide um, or killed herself um, that April. And you can see here we made these signs sending love to try to send messages to the remaining people who were stuck in the rehab in the rehab center in the early days of the pandemic. And you can see here a year later, um, we, we you know as we were kind of beginning to come out from isolation, we uh, had Barbara um, <clears throat> we had a band play. Um, here on the street corner, and you know, neighbors came out on their porches and interacted with masks at, at a distance. So, um, existing mutual aid projects like this could expand and fill new roles in new mutual aid projects formed to address the failure of our society to take care of all people. And as the gaps in the social safety net widened, we caught those who fell through the cracks and we took care of each other. So, I'm going to talk a little bit more about mutual aid in Burlington. These are just, uh, this is a snapshot of what I could think of. There may be more than I missed. So you have a group like Isgood where we share tools and plants and help each other garden and learn from each other and also help each other move furniture, shovel snow, etc. You have the People's Kitchen and the People's Farm Stand, which has fed thousands of people throughout the pandemic in our city. You have Food Not Cops who feeds um, unhoused people every single day downtown at the parking garage. And you have Cop Watch who has helped people um, um, sort of hold police accountable um, in, the, in the absence of community control of police. The Racial Justice Alliance has um, a, 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 a sort of a BIPOC support network when people um, experience hate crimes and hate incidents that is forming. Migrant justice um, is migrant workers helping each other, the worker center of workers helping each other. The Old North End Mutual Aid, every single day we get an email, a request of needs, and people step up and donate money and items to help their neighbors. Um, these groups have grown and filled the gaps during the pandemic, and they need to be considered moving forward as we reimagine public safety. And uh, I, a future public safety net in Burlington, um, I view it as a just transition from a carceral state to a regenerative state. Instead of using force against each other, we try to um, take care of each other better. Um, and I'm not going to read this whole slide right now because I only have two minutes. Um, this is just a snapshot of the current public safety system of care in Burlington. This is just, this may not be everything, but I mapped this out just from my own memory um, as uh, someone who works in many of these pieces. Um, and I, and when we think about the public, uh, the system of care that we have and mutual aid networks, we need to integrate them and then we, we look at what we're not doing yet. And that's where the idea of the Neighborhood Outreach Worker Program came from. Because you can't rely, we cannot rely on volunteers like myself to um, do hours and hours of unpaid labor um, in the absence of the government taking care of the people. We need new programs to do the work, to do some of this work. And so the Neighborhood Outreach Worker Program pilot project, um, we're suggesting it starts in our neighborhood, um, but we think this needs to happen in every neighborhood around the city eventually, where the neighborhood comes up with an idea for how to um, create a peer support program where you pay neighbors to do work to improve quality of life and public safety. So in our neighborhood here, um, those issues would be noise disturbances, parties, disorderly conduct, fighting, fireworks, fires, littering, and vandalism. And what we're suggesting is that we hire students and other residents to work in teams as outreach workers in the neighborhood. And I have a lot of detail about that in here, but one minute left. So I'm not going to go through it all today, but I'll let you, but I'll, slip, I'll share the slideshow with you, and we, uh, people could always talk with me more later. Um, but I'll say a little bit in the remaining minute that um, that we have duties here um, that people could read through that we're proposing for the team in our neighborhood, um, ways to hold that team accountable to the community, um, and how it fits into a public safety system where um, perhaps neighborhood outreach workers can work with the community support liaisons at the police department to respond to 911 calls either in the moment or afterwards for quality of life issues that we would create a new mobile crisis program um, combining EMTs and crisis workers like Hoots in Oregon to answer level 
two, leaving the police to focus on level one, which is what we really need them for. Um, and uh, and um, I guess I'll just, I, do, I have some numbers and stuff for numbers people, some estimated a cost of a program like this um, that you can look at on your own time and possible funding sources. For example, UVM allows 100,000 a year for policing, but our police aren't doing that because it's overtime work and they're already working to fill the gaps of, of their existing duties. So we're suggesting maybe that could be redirected to this kind of a program to take pressure off the police and to, um, Champlain can provide some money, CETO, the city can build into the budget. Um, and these are just two quotes to end with um, from the two co-founders. So you have Phil Hammerslough, since our first block party in 2010, the culture of the street has evolved. You can see it's the change, it's palpable. Students say hello to each other, they say hello to us, we talk, they're sharing going on. And, um, and then a quote for me, the key is to inspire someone to do something greater, to unlock our optimistic doings. Just start with just acknowledging people who live around you. They notice what you do too, so become a role model, invite people in and ask for their ideas. And so, in closing, um, I'm open to talking with anyone in Burlington, not just the people in my ward or neighborhood, about how we can work together um, to take care of each other better. Thank you. Brian, that was great. Um, thank you for doing that, and um, sorry for the time constraint. Um, were there any quick questions before we go? Right, could you stop presenting and we could see all the hands if there are? There are no hands, but I do feel like he just got to the exciting, interesting part when we had to cut it. So, um, Brian, what's the best way for folks to connect to you if they would like to continue talking to you about that? Best way to connect would be to come down to um, Isham Street on Sunday at 11 a.m. and you can help us plant bulbs. Um, we're bringing the whole neighborhood together to plant bulbs as a symbol of the extension of, of the gardens down Booth and Russell and Charles. And then we're going to have a pumpkin, uh, we're going to decorate pumpkins and have a contest. Um, so you can come down and see it in person and talk with us. And if people can't do that, because I know some people physically cannot come down and do that, um, or if you're just dealing with plans, like, like your church is at 11 or something, um, you could email me. Um, you could send me a note by passenger pigeon. You could uh, text me. I don't know, there's many ways to get okay. text me. Yeah. Uh, I, can, I can provide my, maybe I'll provide an email and we'll start right. there. So with my phone, I'm already like way behind on messages. So um, um, you can actually find me really easily if you Google me. So like I can't hide from you. So if you really want to talk to me. Uh, one question really for neighborhoods like uh, ours that are quite different from your war area um, where we don't have a lot of college students necessarily living, mm -hmm. you know, what, what does that mean for funding for student neighborhood partnerships um, in different areas of the city? Um, and also, uh, we do have a lot of families and folks with um, kids in the school district um, so I wonder, is that part of the um, plan at all to connect to the school district? I think each neighborhood needs to be empowered to design programs that meet the needs of this neighborhood by the people who live there. And I've only lived in this, I've lived on this street for 22 years and I lived on Pine Street and King for one year. So I have never lived in the New North End, so it's not, I don't, it's not my place to tell the New North End what your program should be. But what I would say is that it should be designed very start small and then link it together. Maybe look at the neighborhood and look at the streets and look at what are the natural neighborhoods that exist and people organizing within a few blocks of each other and then linking it would be the way to go. And then you can assess, um, you know, even though we have a lot of college students, when we had a meeting in the park, in Pomeroy Park, there were um, lots of families who live along that beltway with small children in the school system. So we had elders, we had babies, we had college students, we had people my age, and I'm not gonna say how old I am. Like, we had a wide range of ages. Um, so I think you know, you'd be surprised when you talk to your neighbors who lives around you. I met a woman who lived here 22 years who I hadn't met the other day. Um, so you know, it's, um, I would just say it starts on the micro level, street by street and, and block by
by block and sort of development by development. But um, I think as people assess around the city what worked for their neighborhood, then we can talk about the funding. But honestly, I think the funding should be coming from the state. Like I think this, um, that we need to look at where state money goes now and, um, and try to slowly but surely invest more money in, in programs like this that will help build um, and it helps with the social determinants of health ultimately. And it's a whole other presentation, we can do that. But by improving the social determinants of health, we will take pressure off the more expensive interventions in society like jails and hospitals. And we, we can save money by spending more on gardens and on Brian, each other and Bri on building relationships with each other and taking care of each other. Brian, can we squeeze in Steve Hamlin? Uh, I'm sorry you didn't have much time to go through that, but do you have a website where we can see those slides that you had to whip through real quick? I, I don't have a website where you can see them, but I will email them to the FDA. And my understanding is the FDA does post things, right? Somewhere? Yeah, we could post it on um, the city's um, NPA CETA website, I would imagine. Yeah, and, and you'll notice that as I get the presentation, it keeps changing because every time I talk to people and they tell me their ideas, I weave it in. So you'll know you'll, you can watch the progression as it's been presented in different MPAs, and I expect that will continue to happen. There's some people I haven't spoken with yet who have a lot to offer on a list, and if you want to if you want to spend some time sharing your ideas outside the meeting, I'm happy to hear them. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, great meeting. Um, Brian, thank you again, um, and again, um, we're looking for new steering committee members as well. We welcomed Olivia. Um, great job today with introductions, um, but thanks for participating, and um, if you'd like to become a member of the steering committee, let us know. Great resource, uh, as I mentioned, to Brian is the city's website. Right at the top is MPAs under search. And then you can get to information on our MPA or ideas for presentations, um, how you can get those ideas to us too. So thanks everybody. Have a good night.